Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric. I'm here with Michael. There is no God. You're listening to Double Feature, and we have some old school American horror today. Hey, look at that. I believe you have tuned into the right channel. That's correct. <laughs> what are the old school American horror movies? Bubba Hotep and Trick or Treat. Holy crap. Spoilers. Chapters. All right, Bubba Hotep. Is that, that's what has to happen. So uh, there's spoilers. We're going to talk about the entire content of both of the movies. We're going to talk about if he's really Elvis or not. We're going to talk about the fucking mummy. We are going to talk about the thing with the head with the bag over it. Brian Cox. Spoilers, sir. Sorry. And no one even knows what's going on right now. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, Bubba Hotep first. Yes. You haven't seen Bubba Hotep yet? Everyone's seen Bubba Hotep. This is the Bruce Campbell episode, this finally, is, right? Well, it's a Bruce Campbell episode. Yeah, it's an episode with Bruce there Campbell. There we go. <laughs> I don't know how Bruce Campbell has evaded our show for nearly three years. Same way he's evaded the majority of the public's <laughs> eye. Wow, that is weird. Everyone, Unless you watch Burn Notice. You watch Burn Notice, right? I don't even know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, uh, I think everybody who listens to the show knows who Bruce Campbell is, but they're dying to hear us talk about him for whatever reason. What's bizarre is that the people that know who Bruce Campbell is don't watch burn notice i still don't get that joke and then after that you can skip over use the chapters and uh we're going to talk about trick or treats so bubba hotep is bubba ho hyphen tep yes and trick or treat bubba is actually in a person from a trailer park and hotep as in a mummy from ancient Good. egypt you got it you got it trick or treat is just the letter r it's like toys right. r us but right. it's got a little uh, apostrophe before they are right trick as in i don't know a worm in your apple treat as in no worm in your apple I was going to go with a trick is something whores do for money or cocaine. All right. So time to start the show. I would have also accepted Bubba Hotep and Jack Brooks Monster Slayer. Yeah. Or Bubba Hotep and half the other fucking movies we've done on the show. But we have Bubba Hotep and Trick or Treat. That's right. And I guess the first name, the lesser mentioned name about Bubba Hotep mm -hmm. is Don Coscarelli. Right. The Phantasm. So you mentioned that- He's not the Phantasm. He's the Phantasm director. You mentioned the Phantasm director before. Uh -huh. uh, Phantasm is a series of films? It's a series of films that exceeds four. That's really all I'm ready to say right now. Hmm. Interesting. Exceeds four, does it? Would you say these are horror films? Yeah. I would say a palooza of people get killed. Now, this is not just Don coming over to Bubba Hotep. Right. But we have the same editor, the same cinematographer, the same art director, mm -hmm. half the same fucking crew, yeah, probably it, more than half the crew right. from the Phantasm movies. He's kind of an exclusive director. He did, a, he did a Masters of Horror thing, which is how you know you're a horror director nowadays. Apparently. But he, uh, yeah, Phantasm was a big thing for him, and he's just, he's kind of weird. He's a weird guy. He has a lot of really big ideas, mm -hmm. and so it makes sense that he would stick with the people that kind of worked that out in the past. You mean big ideas like Elvis and JFK in a retirement home fighting a mummy? Yes, that would be... <laughs> I believe any time anyone's tried to get anybody else to watch this movie, they've used that exact statement. That's mm -hmm. it, right? Yeah. Is that how you describe this Absolutely. to people? Absolutely. I Elvis, usually say JFK, Black retirement JFK. Home. Ooh, Black JFK. How did I miss that? Yeah. Chocolate Ding Dong JFK. I haven't seen the Phantasm stuff yet, mm -hmm. but I hope the editing is the same. Once upon a time, I made a call for American. I, we were probably talking about old school American horror, yeah, as we do every other fucking week on the show. If it's not that, it's Splat Pack, so we should just shut our fucking mouths. But I was saying, hey, you know, the Japanese, I really love that editing. Mm -hmm. I think it was on year one recap, or we were reading emails or something. Uh, start sending those emails, by the way. We're going to read those in 90 weeks when this year is uh, over. And I was talking about, I love the jumpy edits. I love, it's almost glitchy cinematography. Yeah. Uh, things just, you know, someone will be walking towards you. We cut out a section of that frame. They jump, they make a little leap. And uh, it's, it's a cheap gimmick, but I fucking love it. I don't know why. I just, that frenetic style of editing, really dig that stuff. And a lot of times it's accompanied, as it is in Bubba Hotep, with flashbulb sounds. Mm -hmm. And just those, those kind of flickers. That I think that's where the glitchy nature yeah, comes in. Right. That's, that's what makes it, it feel. That's where it stops looking like, hey, they cut out a piece of film and instead there's something fucked up going on right now. Yeah, as if you can't even trust the camera. Mm -hmm. You can't even trust the medium by which they're showing you the fucked up stuff. It was super popularized when The Ring came out. Sure, Everybody's sure. seen The Ring, but 
It's when the chick, the girl in the TV, right? That's mm-hmm. her whole gimmick is that she's still digital despite being in the real world. So we're using that stuff all over the place, especially when uh, I'm just going to keep calling him Elvis. Uh, when he's waking up and he's looking out into the hallway earlier in the movie, we get a lot of that stuff. Really fucking dig it. That and the, you know, Japanese sunburst design, light array design coming from yeah. behind the mummy. It's, which it's is pretty kind of, it's somewhere between Japanese and like real shitty nightclub. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It could be that one too. Let's go with Japanese. Wedding. It's like wedding that dance. Sounds, wedding dance lighting. Sticking with the Japanese. So something we definitely need to talk about mm-hmm. is the fact that Bubba Hotep achieved nearly instant cult yeah, status. Almost it's it's kind of like the trailer came out, people found out what it was about, and then it was a cult film. I mean, this was one of the first cult movies I ever knew about. Mm-hmm. I guess it was, you know, Rocky Horror years before that, obviously, but uh when I started collecting DVDs, and this was back in the era of DVDs. Right, when DVDs were out, important. And I had that sort of elevator pitch given to me of, you know, Black JFK and Mummies and whatever, and I saw the cover, Bubba Hotep, I have to see this thing. So one of the things, I mean, you know, it had a road show, which is really interesting. Right. We talked about that with Repo. We don't need to go into it huge here, but the creators not given a super wide release. That's another thing these movies have in common today. Mm-hmm. Neither this or Trick or Treat were right. given a decent, solid release. What you release. mean to say is they weren't given the release they deserved is what you're trying to get at. Yeah, but that might have added to the cult It appeal. probably did. You know, people feel like they're the underdog. I was just talking to you about the the paranormal activity stuff mm-hmm. and how Twitter is the reason that movie even exists. Right. Well, those movies. Absolutely. Absolutely. People uh, felt that they were part of a campaign to make the movie bigger, mm-hmm. to get the movie seen. And because they felt like they were part of that, they wanted to go see the movie. They felt the need to support something they'd been a champion of. Mm-hmm. And so these direct-to-DVD releases, both in Trick or Treat right. and in Bubba Hotep, I think probably had something to do with that. Also, the roadshow nature, the same yep. thing we saw with Repo, getting right. that early cult status. Yeah, I think a lot of what, what made Bubba Hotep cult popular right away mm. was the fact that not a lot of people knew about it, which instantly sure. makes sure. it cool. Yeah. And the fact that it, when you're watching it, it feels inaccessible. Yeah, right. You're watching it, and you in your mind are thinking there's something you're not getting here. Yep. And by the time it ends, it's like jazz. You're like, well, I, I enjoyed that, yeah, but I right. feel like I wasn't really in on it. Sure. But if I pretend I really like it, <laughs> everybody will think I'm cool. And so here we are on our show, pretending we like it. Well, I mean, I think people do thoroughly enjoy it, but I think no, absolutely. you have to watch it a few times before you realize that it doesn't have this higher level right. that it boasts the whole time time yeah yeah but you can still pretend that it it's just this this kind of mask of inaccessibility that i think gives it a popular cult status because it's not something like planet terror Mm -hmm. where everything is over the top and very much there and there's a history exactly you know planet terror calls back to things uh at the very least in style bubba hotep you start thinking what elvis jfk mummy all right something weird right is going where's this idea come from exactly exactly and there's also something really appealing when you figure out there's nothing there. Mm-hmm. It's even more approachable because of that. It feels more warm. It feels more uh, welcoming. The jokes get better. Yeah, they do get better. Because you don't feel like they're on you. Yeah, it's just a crazy person who came up with this idea and crazy people who thought it was funny and acted it out. It's so sincere and so pure about that. I think we're overlooking a key component to said status, though. Ossie Davis. I don't know what that means. Bruce Campbell? Yes. That okay. <laughs> Bruce Campbell is the star of this film. Mm -hmm. Bruce Campbell's name is not Bubba Hotep. No. Anybody who has ever seen the DVD and not seen the movie, and maybe even some people that have seen the movie, are under the impression that Bruce Campbell is Bubba Hotep. When in fact, Bubba Hotep is the one that's on fire. Exactly. All the fucking time. That's pretty much the best way to gauge it. Yeah. Bruce Campbell plays Elvis in this Mm -hmm. film. It's easier than Bubba Hotep. Yeah, right. But more importantly than who Bruce Campbell is truly playing than who is the Bubba Hotep yeah. is who is Bruce Campbell. I think the only time we've mentioned Bruce Campbell on the show, we might have done it during the Sam Raimi uh, Drag Me to Hell and Inside, but I know we did it when we talked JCBD and Bronson because uh, fairly recently around that show, I had seen My Name is Bruce. Right. And uh, and so that had to come up a little bit in figuring out what the fuck was going on with those movies and self-aware film and film about, you know, films with actors playing themselves. But none of this is what Bruce Campbell is actually known for. Right. Bruce Campbell is a, he's known as a huge B movie star. Yeah, right. He, so his most popular films are probably the Evil Dead trilogy. Sure, or sure. Or the Evil Dead 
one and two and then army of darkness oh my god and rightfully so i mean are, if yeah. somebody you know sometimes you see the origins of a certain popular actor and you look back and you see their early work and uh surprisingly sometimes it's well deserved mm-hmm. um, when we talked about some of the stallone stuff i thought the the first couple movies he did were really really interesting and i see why that fame came up you're talking about death race 2000 uh no that's not what i'm talking about uh, maybe you look at someone like Arnold Schwarzenegger and you think, all right, I'm not really sure how he got off the ground. Or maybe that's not what you think. He got to the chopper you, how he got off the ground. You look at Bruce Campbell, and I mean, the Evil Dead movies are pretty fucking terrific. Mm-hmm. And and then since then, he never really did anything that, aside from Burn Notice, that gave him some really good... Mainstream fame. No yeah, mainstream exactly. fame. It was all B movies. He did he did a lot of weird sci fi. Yeah. Every movie he did, he was the star of. Sure. To let you know how unsuccessful these films were in the mainstream world, he was the star of almost every one of these films, and you haven't heard of any of them. With the exception of when he's used in a cameo in a mainstream film. Right. When you look at something like uh The Woods, which was a little mm-hmm. more mainstream than you might right. might realize today. Or, you know, even the Spider-Man movies, right? Raimi's Spider-Man films. Or if he does a cameo and say, Escape from L.A., which I ah, until right. right now forgot Bruce Campbell was Oh, in. yeah, you're so right. So Bruce Campbell might be the answer to this next question. And somebody, I, we'll get Evil Dead somehow, and we'll talk about Bruce Campbell. That I mean, you just need to see Evil Dead, and mm-hmm. then I think you really start to get that. But the next thing I was interested in asking you about was that, you know, Baba Hotep itself makes no apologies about the exposition in the movie. And in any other film, we would rally against this. Somehow here, it is absolutely okay. So one, do you agree with that? And two, why? Yeah, no, I, I think I absolutely agree with it. And I think a lot of that, well, a lot of that comes from Bruce Campbell's charisma. All right, so is that it, the Bruce Campbell? Is that sure, the answer? <laughs> but I also think that a lot of it has to do with the the score and the way that all the backstories have these really heroic slow shot you mean western versus heist film that's what you're talking well, about. well yeah it's all of these these like when he goes back and you first see him trade with sebastian half yeah everything's in slow motion it's very heroic and it's it's kind of this weird vignette of it means something yeah it's all idolatry of the yeah, situation yep. none of it happens kind of offhandedly everything he talks about is grave and important to the storyline mm-hmm. and it also tells you exactly what's going on Yeah, it goes straight into that backstory, too. You start getting the exposition, and you're thinking, all right, here's a scene where they give me a lot of unnecessary, I don't need the backstory, let's just fight mummies. And then when you see the backstory, you think, oh, we're going to do some of this. I actually do want to see Bruce Campbell as Elvis in the day. And then you get JFK's backstory, and you get uh, you know more exposition on the characters. You get... um, Eventually, you get Bubba Hotep as well. Mm -hmm. You get the, the flash of how he kind of came here today. I think their approach is, one, that the exposition is part of the fun, Mm -hmm. and two, that they just keep fucking doing it until it's accepted. Yep. If you didn't think it was okay the first time around, we're going to give you another Elvis story and some JFK info and Bubba Hotep, and then the movie's going to be over, so deal with it. So a lot of what that backstory goes to establish is that the guy who starts off in the film being called Sebastian Half, Bruce Mm -hmm. Campbell's... The, the retirement home Bruce Campbell. Yeah, right. The one laying in bed. Is actually Elvis. Mm-hmm. That's what the entire backstory goes to present. That's what everything in the film will point to. That's But that's all under the fact that Bruce Campbell is the narrator. Right. He essentially believes the situation. So Of course he does. He's a little bit unreliable because <laughs> right. he's old and everybody thinks he's senile. So, you know, you can't be 100% sure that he's Elvis. Yeah. But do you ever doubt for a moment that he's Elvis? And Only when the movie's off. Yeah. Only when the movie's off. Every time I go back, I think, oh, this is a movie about a guy who thinks he's Elvis. And he's totally not. But maybe the movie kind of, uh-huh. I was going to say walks the line. That would have been a misstep. The misstep was a pun about walking the line. Fuck. But then the movie starts and the movie tells you he's Elvis. Mm-hmm. The narrator tells you he's Elvis. And the movie doesn't really make you... There's nobody who really questions that outside of the nurse. Right. Well, the only other really likable character who is JFK, or is he, definitely believes he's Elvis. But that brings me to my second question is, is Ossie Davis actually JFK, or is he some crazy black guy who sometimes uses a wheelchair? Oh, you better believe he's JFK. He's got the scar. He's amazing. I might even like him more than Bruce Campbell in this movie. I don't know what it is about him. He's just funny as shit. It's his ability to translate hieroglyphics and his very odd protection of his own asshole. Cleopatra does the nasty. 
I don't know about Elvis. I don't know even more about JFK. I mean, uh, I guess it's harder to believe because of the skin pigmentation. Right. Well, they I mean, dyed that is... him that color. What better way of hiding him could you think of? And it's funny, too, because that's how a JFK conspiracist would think. Sure. Right? Well, because it's all opportune. You, right. you come up with the end oh, result, God. and then you just have to figure out how you got there. And every hole in your theory is part of the vast conspiracy. It only serves to further emphasize your point, to further cement your own reality. Oh, self-deceived lunatics. I don't know about that one. What I know about Elvis is that this movie, so uh, he kills the giant bug. We're left thinking, wow, what a badass. We get that very Bruce Campbell scene. It's all he's slapstick and got fun. a bedpan and he's yep. killing the bug. And uh, there's all these great shots. And then afterwards, he's triumphant. But I mean, we did just see the old lady kill a bug too. A That's lot faster. True. That's very so, true. So while the movie kind of says, well, this is great. He's going to kill the mummy. He's, you know, he's getting his fucking mojo back. Uh, the old woman killed the bug. So I don't know about that. But when the movie's not telling us that Elvis is trying to regain his former glory, I mean, that's the whole character arc. Mm. Elvis is trying to get up out of the bed and reconcile all the shit that he did wrong. Yeah, well, that's the other half, right? Right. Reconcile all the shit he did wrong. This is made a little weirder by the fact that his family's still alive. Right. Right. That Elvis's every time family he goes, I wonder what my daughter would think. Because you <laughs> know also, she probably saw wonder. the movie. Right. And now I want to know what she thinks she would think if that was her father. I don't bed. know if she saw the movie or if it's just another piece of weird Elvis memorabilia she doesn't give a shit about. But that question enters my mind three or four times in the movie. What would she think? What if they approached her about appearing in the movie? Mm -hmm. How would she react to that? But yeah, the movie is telling you what an awful, terrible human being he was. He keeps saying, man, I was really bad to my wife. I'm so sorry about that. I shouldn't have been bad to my wife. And I was really, really bad to my daughter. I, I shouldn't have been so bad to my daughter. I mean, I tried under the circumstances, but I really fucked up. And I did all those drugs. I really, mm -hmm. I shouldn't have done so many drugs. I wasted I was my time. I wasted my life. Now I'm doing stuck a lot in of a drugs. bed. With a growth on my pecker. Oddly, though, they don't blame the eating right. on, <laughs> on actual Elvis. Well, because that's not actual Elvis. That's blamed on the impersonator. Right. All I know about Elvis is fried chicken and weird banana. Banana and peanut butter on everything. Right. That's, I mean, that's all I know. That's the part of Elvis I want to celebrate. And I, uh, and I feel a little let down knowing that up oh, the drugs were bad the the daughter and wife stuff was bad but maybe that's the movie's way of celebrating the food stuff mm -hmm. putting that on someone else and saying that part was okay that's why our character flawed elvis is not part of that late in life food obsession so we talked about the conspiracy we talked about the swap we talked about um the former glory so i think the last central component to the movie is comedy without dignity yeah we covered bruce campbell already Fuck you. When I say comedy without dignity, what I mean is, uh, what I mean is he's laying there in the bed uh -huh. and he gets a heart on when yep. he's being medicated and the movie doesn't give a shit. No nope. movie doesn't fucking care about it at all. He's just I a mean, rascal. The nurse who, by the way, I find very attractive is treating it without real alarm or even offense. Mm -hmm. uh, you rascal, right? You rascal. I mean, what kind of response is that? This is just another part of her job. She's a little offended, but barely offended. Not nearly as offended as, as even the audience right. is at this point. Well, there's battle with a bedpan. There's hieroglyphics written on the urinal wall. Right. If you want to talk about no dignity, you start talking about soul residue shit. Eat souls? Crap soul residue. I mean, that's just the facts. That's another thing is Bubba Hotep consumes souls uh, through your ass. Right, which is foreshadowed when uh, Elvis talks about how he could have had the nurse eating out of his asshole, right? That's foreshadowing. That was so amazing, Michael. I do not know that we can even continue this conversation from here. Yes, an excellent bit of foreshadowing. Okay. Nothing in this movie is necessary. Everything is fucking absurd and amazing. So then there's Trick or Treat. There is Trick or Treat. Trick or Treat is written and directed by Michael Doherty, right. who was the writer of Brian Singer's uh, second X-Men movie, yeah. which is probably my favorite of the X-Men movies. Definitely my favorite. It also has two of the same actors in this film. Brian Cox and Anna Packin are both. Not a Brian Singer actor is Tom O'Pennicott, mm -hmm. who is a dollhouse actor. And okay. anytime I can shoehorn a dollhouse reference into the show, you know I'm going to fucking do it. Even if you can't pronounce the guy's name. Foreshadowing. I hate you. <laughs> so this movie was done in 2007. And it was kind of shown in a bunch of small places. 
Uh, I wouldn't say it quite got the roadshow treatment, but a lot of little festivals. It played in Chicago at, um, I don't know if you've ever gone to any of the Tear in the Isle stuff. Mm. They've been doing them every year. They might even do them a couple times a year at the Portage Theater. And that was the only time it was really shown in theaters, at least in our area, or you know, at the, the other festival stuff. It didn't come out on DVD until 2009. And as we talked about with Bubba Hotep, when it came out on DVD, the shit was everywhere. Everybody was talking about it. It's getting all these reviews because everybody was, you know, discussing it at these little festivals and it's an exclusive club there. You can't go out to, I guess we could have gone there. We live in a huge fucking Mm -hmm. city, but a lot of people can't go and see it. So the festivals give it buzz. The movie won't get a wide release. And so that almost works in the movie's favor in this case. I mean, I don't know fiscally if it works in the movie's favor because for whatever reason, I guess... It makes more money when your movies in movie theaters. I don't know mm-hmm. because of date movies, right? Because, because, because people because go paranormal out and activity. That's yeah, why. right, right. So your movie makes fucking bank there, but still, all of these people, probably more people, see it because it comes out on DVD and it's such a huge thing, and that's the first time it's out. And they've been holding back all this other stuff, you know, waiting for the DVD release. We get the um, the comic book credits that mm-hmm. I like a lot in the beginning of the movie. Very Repo-esque. Yeah, again, to hit on the Repo stuff. The comic book novel, uh, the graphic novel of the Trick or Treat stuff got pushed back to the same time as the DVD release. So now we're getting comic book stuff. There's fucking action figure stuff. There's all this stuff that's been piling up for years waiting for the release of the movie. The movie itself is something of an anthology. It's mm-hmm. a lot of these little stories that yeah. overlap. And we're not going to talk about those connections a whole lot. There's something kind of specific I want to talk about. It's not the Halloween block party. Okay. But I do want to mention Halloween block party. Do we have that shit in Chicago? Absolutely. That looked really fun. You know what? And it had a bunch of teenagers and drinking, Mm -hmm. neither of which I give a shit about. And it still looked really Mm -hmm. fun. What we have here is something I've probably mentioned briefly on the show before, but this is an excuse to really dive into it. We have a movie that's, it's written a lot smarter than it needs to be, and it, uh, it uses a, a mechanism that a lot of horror movies use, but gives something of a tribute to the horror fans in doing it. I'll explain what I mean. So um, let's look at uh, one of the first interactions, one of the early interactions. We have Dylan Baker, who's awesome, as uh, Principal Wilkins. Mm-hmm. So Dylan Baker has been in a ton of stuff. He was in the Spider-Man movies I already tagged yeah. and might as well just hit on again. He's um, Dr. Kurt Connors in the Raimi movies, a character who was going to be the lizard and never really came to fruition. And we have talked too much about the Spider-Man movies already. I apologize. But on our show, he was in Requiem for a Dream. He was uh, he's the doctor that shows up at the end. Mm -hmm. And he's amazing in the movie Happiness, which we're going to force people to watch at some point. He's sitting across from Brett Kelly, who we've also seen on the show Mm -hmm. before. In Bad Santa. As awkward Canadian actor kid in Bad Santa. And there is this glorious chocolate vomit moment. It turns to blood halfway through, which yeah, makes it right, just that right. much better. How would you describe the sound that's coming out? Because that's my favorite part. It sounds like a, a squelch. <laughs> that would be, if I could come up with a word to squelch describe it. Squelch is fine, sure. I would say squelch. It sound, it's wet. It's a thick it's liquid thick. suction sound. Oh, it's terrible and amazing. And I mean, there's nothing really, it's not chunky, it's not nope. gory. But the sound just makes it so fucking wrong. And it's such a projection and Mm -hmm. it just keeps going. It's beautiful. That's not what I was going to talk about, though. I was going to talk about how this movie, you know, when it's on script writing wise, when it's uh, when the movie's turned on, it's extremely smart. It does these, you know, these little stories, fun stories. It doesn't have to do anything fancy in writing, but it does. It still shines and it uses this. um I guess we'll boil it down to the ABC method. Mm, yeah. We'll think of it like a uh, high school test. Like a standardized test. Great, because that's something people want to think about when they're watching a fun movie. Listening to podcasts, take a standardized test. I've tried to articulate this on other people's shows and previously on our show, and I could never do so. So I'm just going to lay this out now, mm-hmm. and then you can kind of clean up the confusing shit that I say that doesn't make any sense. All right. So after Principal Wilkins goes back inside... He walks downstairs. He's got this knife. You know, there's, there's been a scene uh, before this, but he's inside now. He's with his son. He's got the knife. Now, he shows up behind his son in what is a very common horror movie moment. Mm-hmm. We as the audience now have a little bit of information that one or more of the characters in the scene doesn't have. Dramatic theatrical irony. Now, we are meant to think that A, 
he is going to stab his son. That seems to be the most blatant face value thing that's going to happen. And you know, we we might need to come up with a good term for this on Double Feature because we see it in pretty much every horror movie that's ever happened. And in the shitty horror movies, there's a, I'm thinking Wes Craven movies. Right. This is happening for the first hour of the movie. So we think something brutal is going to happen. He's going to stab his son with a knife. He's talking about it, kind of suggesting that that's the case. But then as the situation develops, the people who are familiar with horror movies, the, uh, the people, I, I would say all but the most gullible people, anybody who's seen a horror film knows that it will not be situation A. Right. He will not stab his son. Right. But in fact, it's going to be cop-out situation Where B. Where he stabs the pumpkin in front of his son. Right, because he's about to carve a pumpkin. So now we're left with this choice. Is it going to be A? Is it going to be B? Sometimes horror movies, they pick A, and they do actually stab his son. The thing with, the thing with picking A in this situation is mm-hmm. you cannot be wrong. The film cannot lose sure. by picking A because it presents you with an option tells you that's where it's going to go. And by choosing that option, if you feel betrayed, it's because you, for some reason, did not believe what the film told you. And that's good for horror fans because we're so used to this mechanism of A or B Mm -hmm. that we usually think it's going to be B. We fear B. We think it's going to be the cop-out. In our heads, as we're watching this, as people who love horror films watch this, we think, oh, please don't let it be a pumpkin. Oh, man, it's going to be... I'm going to be so mad if it's a pumpkin. And then he stabs his son and we kind of say, oh, yay. Trick or Treat does one better, and it's so smart about this, and I love it. And we can revisit this, um, this A-B scenario mm-hmm. in, uh, in the other things it does. But in this particular instant, Trick or Treat opts for not A, stabbing his son, mm-hmm. not B, stabbing a pumpkin, but it does C, an option that we have not yet considered. Right. This is a more, uh, a more creative option, an option that will absolutely surprise everyone because it's built on exploiting the false dichotomy right which is great that it's also a false dichotomy mechanism that it's disproving Uh while offering a simple horror movie kill Mm -hmm. instead of going with a or b the only two options really kind of presented to us the only two on our mind he stabs brett kelly's head which happens to be on the table in front now brett kelly's head was not an option that we had considered and this also has an interesting little twist on the side in that his son who we thought he was going to stab is now in on this. Uh His son is okay with this murder that this whole time we assumed because there were other things we were conscious of thinking about where we thought the the layers we thought the film was operating Mm -hmm. on. We had not considered that his son might be in on it and they might be carving up a kid's head. It's dark humor. It's an option we didn't consider. It disproves false dichotomies. It's beautiful. I love it. All sorts of fucked up. So let's take another one, right? The, um, The school bus massacre. Right. So here we have... And there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of situations you can now look at and say A or B in the movie. But let's just take a couple clear ones, a big picture ones. In the school bus massacre, we're given a, uh, a ghost story. And when the kids go down there, we start to see what's going to be ghosts. And then it's revealed to us that the ghosts are a prank. Mm-hmm. It's the other kids dressed up to scare right. a few of the kids. Now, the answer here eventually goes back and becomes ghosts once again. Right. So I might say that it, you know, became answer A. Right. But I guess you could even say it's both. It's both. I would say, I mean, yes, I would say it was both. Well, because essentially what happens is the original presentation is, okay, it's ghosts. And as horror movie fans, you start going, yeah, ghosts are more like a prank because kids are jerks on Halloween. Right. And so that would be option B, kids are jerks on Halloween. So eventually ghosts come out, kill the kids that are jerks on Halloween, and the victims get to change hands and everybody has a great time because eventually both situations happen. So you thought it was A, the ghosts. The film told you it's actually answer B. And and by the time you thought you had gotten the answer, it turns out it's still answer A. So it happened to be both of the answers. Uh, Something that happens every once in a while in movies, not nearly as clever as the, uh, the ABC scenario we got previously, but also the film isn't just repeating its mechanism. Mm -hmm. We would become clever to that. So we're aware of such a mechanism now. We just have to choose for ourselves which it's going to be. It keeps us guessing. And in a movie that's like, I don't know, an hour and 20 Mm -hmm. minutes, that is awesome. The only thing I really want to say about the school bus massacre itself is I love the way it ends. Mm -hmm. I love kind of the, the underdog story that happens, but I love when the girl in the witch costume comes back up and you have the sounds of the other children screaming down below 
And then she leaves against the whimsical score yeah, once so again. The thing about Trick or Treat is the first time I saw it, I remember the score really grating on my mind. Mm-hmm. The whimsy. You didn't like the whimsy. It's because, yeah, because I thought, the, I thought the film was trying to be cute. I thought the film was trying to go, hey, look, it's, a, it's kind of like a kid's movie, but it's super violent. Mm-hmm. But we'll put a whimsical score so that you still think it's a kid's movie. And right. now we're being just really chic yeah. and, and pretending we're something we're not, which makes the violence that much cooler. And that pissed me off the first time. But going into it, knowing that the film is just a kid's movie that's super violent, <laughs> that makes the movie for me. Suddenly I absolutely it. love it. Second and then time I, underst- around, it. I guess I, under- I understand it a little bit mm-hmm. better because I'm not trying to figure out what the film's trying to do for me. It's part of setting that mood, which is something I love so much about Trick or Treat. It's the kind of thing that around Halloween, I wish I had a fireplace so I could sit down by the fire, Brian Cox style, and, you know, and watch Trick or Treat. Mm-hmm. But it, it's just so good to throw on and keeping it kind of lighthearted and having that fucked up children's movie, but also look right. at this grotesque shit kind of happening is beautiful. Also beautiful werewolf tits. Uh, the werewolf woman is another situation mm-hmm. that we can consider because if we're going to look at it face value without the vampire part, because right. that's kind of its own mm-hmm. AB situation. But we have option A. It's just some girls. That's what the movie sets us up. The movie gives us a little bit of a twist. It says, mm, option B, looks like they might be werewolves. And then the movie kind of pauses and says, oh no, it's really option B. They're yeah. really werewolves. It's one of those moments that just leaves you sitting there going, this is really happening. Nobody's going to wake up from a flashback. There's not going to be a weird thing. It just took you a while to figure out there's werewolves and there's totally fucking werewolves. The other thing I love about this scene is uh, Sweet Dreams by yeah. Marilyn Manson in 2007, 2009. Good choice, movie. Way to go. But then you have the the gorgeous women, the tits, the unzipping of the skin. The whole fucking thing is great. I even love the the teeth and the eyes. Yeah. Usually werewolf transformations, eh, not Lame. so much, don't know. But ah, just something about the way they do. You know they save their budget for a couple of these key moments. Well, a lot of what goes on in this film, and, and the big things for me are the werewolves, and when we get to Peeping Tommy, a.k.a. Sam, a little Hell bit later yeah. here, none of it is computer generated. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, right. I mean, that's all I have to say. Thank you. None of it's computer generated. So you think the eyes and the teeth are probably contacts, prosthetics? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean the eyes not, might be a little they're... bit digitally manipulated right, and the right. teeth are probably digitally manipulated, but I'm talking specifically about the creature effect. When we see the, the full physical werewolf, yeah. that's a fucking werewolf. Nothing is uh, generated from computers from scratch is what mm-hmm. you're saying. And if it is, they do a damn good job. It looks really good. I should also mention at this point, something, something really like the color. It's orange and it glows and it goes with a fucking whimsy and I love it. Uh, Not computer generated is the hot dog costume. That's true. So this is another one of those things and it's one of the more obvious things of the movie, but that doesn't stop me from loving it. It's these little crossovers you get in the anthology, the Pulp Fiction style, several things going on at once, you know, something that was, uh, that was really big in that era of Mm -hmm. filmmaking. Stuff like um, like Go or, I mean, we could come up with a thousand films that kind of have these competing stories that bleed over here or there. Right. And we talked about it back on that show when we did Sin City and Pulp Fiction. Talked about trying to line things up and that giving your film just, a, just another little thing to be remembered for and puzzled over. Mm-hmm. And again, short film like this, I mean, it just picks, it knows exactly what it's doing. So you see the hot dog costume in that right. werewolf scene. And I love that because that was one of the weirder moments from the movie and it's just to kind of remind you all these things are going on at once look at all these characters and that's what ended up with the hot dog guy that's Mm -hmm. where he went the other one i like and this one's super obvious but i fucking love it is when krieg gets attacked and we see it earlier in the movie when we don't really know what's doing the attacks yet right we see it when the principal is digging the hole or arranging the ditch or whatever the fuck he's doing in the backyard and as he comes back inside Something just flies by the window, and it's fucking scary, and you think, oh, maybe we'll never go back to it. Mm-hmm. Then we get to Krieg, and eventually you realize, uh, maybe by the time you get to the backyard, or at least at that point, you go, oh, uh, something bad happens to Krieg when he goes in that house, doesn't it? And it does. So Krieg is played by Brian Cox, who we kind of briefly discussed. Great actor, love Brian Cox. Also, Krieg is the bus driver that kills all the little children. Right, right. Or I guess, no, he doesn't kill the little children. (laughs) He parks the bus on the cliff and one of the kids drives the bus off the cliff, leaving a piece of moral ambiguity that is probably not for this show. I was literally just going to say a piece of moral ambiguity not up for discussion on today's episode. 
But what ends up happening here is he gets attacked by Peeping Tommy, who is this little pumpkin headed thing that right. we keep seeing in all of the stories. He's my favorite aspect of Trick or Treat. Absolutely. Second oh, and favorite. Trick or Treat knows that too. Yeah. Look at the cover and right. the toys and shit. And then my second favorite being Krieg. Yeah. And uh, this is just where we get a good old fashioned slashery thing where Peeping Tommy's in the house. He's got a bunch of Halloween themed weapons. Usually right. it's just a thing that you like from Halloween. Pick any given thing. For example, I don't know. Give me one. Candy. Put a razor blade in that. That's a weapon now. Give me another one. Uh, jelly beans. Razor blade in that. That's another one. Give me one more. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm out. Razor blade in that one too. Perfect. Three weapons for Peeping Tommy to use. If you can't think of something to put a razor blade in, think of something sharp. Like, I don't know, a sharded lollipop. Essentially what goes on here is we have a really graphic scene where Kree gets his, his legs sliced up, his dog gets killed, and it's all because Peeping Tommy just wants a candy bar because he's a he's a Halloween curmudgeon, right? And he won't give candy to the kids. That's what it is, right? It has yeah. to be that uh, that Peeping Tommy that I, he's also credited as Sam. I right. don't understand where these names come from, but I assume that's his mm-hmm. his credit. Don't know what his deal is. He's probably responsible for the first murder, which sure. turns out to be chronologically one of the last murders, right. I think which we find out later. Right. I think he's essentially some sort of uh, uh, arbiter of Halloween spirit. Beautiful. Love it. So he gets in a big fight with, uh, and there's a lot of great stuff that goes on there. Mm-hmm. There's the writing on the walls. There's the, the Home Alone-esque hijinks that yeah. ensue. And there's the eventual stabbing the candy bar, again, that A or B scenario, and then just taking off with the candy, leaving you with this uh, what the hell is going on kind of moment when you come upon finally a realization of what might be going on. Mm -hmm. And he leaves and we have the attacks and, you know, the rest of the movie follows. Okay, so awesome. Good job, movie. What have you? Uh, I'm really upset to come back to real world now Mm -hmm. that while we get our paranormal activity every year and, and whatever... Um, I'm never going to rally for films to stop being made or what have right. you. Why isn't there a trick or treat happening every single year? I have year? no idea. Trick or that treat, would be amazing. Trick or treat for me seems like the most apt yearly franchise that anyone could ever do around Halloween. It's so good. It's as if there's a, a Halloween special that's yeah, coming on it's every just, year. It's easy. You don't have to do a whole lot of work because it's a bunch of short stories. You and have it's all your, in writing. Yeah, you just you, write good stuff. You have a continuous character oh. that you can bring back, have him do the same thing. He can be the only continuous story arc. Do an urban one, do a cornfield one, do one in space. I don't fucking care. Right. So I paint this for me. What does this what does this look like? So we have the same Sam kid. Yeah. He comes have, back. We have Peeping Tommy who comes back and he just he kind of wanders around whatever area. So let's say the second one is urban, for okay, example. Sure. The second one would actually just be another suburban one because that's what you can do for sequels, is just rip off the first one. That's fine. But let's say the second one's urban. So we're in Chicago. And it's a bunch of stories that kind of surround some urban lore, you know, alligators in the sewers, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So people die, people are killed, people are mauled, Halloween hijinks ensue in various degrees of violence and mayhem. And supernaturality. Exactly, because it doesn't matter. Yeah. After you have this outline of what's going to happen in the film, you take your list of characters, go, who is a Halloween curmudgeon and who isn't home to give out candy? Right. Then you figure out how to integrate Peeping Tommy killing them at the opportune moments in the story. Sure. And then maybe at the end of the movie, give a tiny little tidbit of information about Peeping Tommy, like his home address or maybe his screen Some trivia, right? Something that that seems like a big meaty chunk of his background. We're finding out about the killer. But is absolutely arbitrary to what's going on. This is brilliant. This is such a good idea. Someone please start doing that. We need... A whole decade of this. I want 10 of these movies and I want them coming out every single year. We have this great framework. The hard work is already done. All we need is, you know, four incredible short scripts. They don't even have to be incredible. That's the nature of having four or five of these. Mm-hmm. You just need like, uh, One I don't can know. end in werewolves and the other three are not effective. <laughs> sure. We could have some supernatural ones. We could do some crazy shit. But as long as we have uh, two that are really, really well written. I mean, I just want to show up every year and see what kind of stuff we're throwing mm-hmm. in. It's this, uh, it's this great way to continue a franchise without forcing people to sit down and create retcons or do you know really zany shit to say, well, let's take it in this direction. Let's do this with it. Here's how we're going to reboot this character. We just write four or five new stories every time. Mm-hmm. All the other work is done, and we actually maintain, you know, we have a whole slasher franchise where we can maintain artistic credibility. Mm-hmm. 
it's such a bittersweet thing. I'm so uh, I'm I'm equally enthused and angered that that this doesn't that this doesn't exist. But thank fuck we have trick or treat. All right, so there's uh, some more movies coming on the show next time. Mm-hmm. We have a website doublefeatureshow dot com and an email address doublefeatureshow at gmail dot com. There's a Facebook you can join up and write some stuff, and iTunes you can leave a review. And if you go to donate dot doublefeatureshow dot com. You can send us a donation and tell us what films you want us to do at the end of the year. We're actually going to pick two of these films mm-hmm. that people are telling us we should do, and uh, we're going to pair them up at the end of the year. Donate.doublefeatureshow.com. All of the house stuff out of the way, what are we actually doing on the show? Uh, next time, so I don't know if anybody remembers back when we did, uh, what was it, the we're, the first We're Uncomfortable with the Subject Matter show. Beautiful. Which was, uh, we did Hero and Black Dynamite in a modern version of black exploitation and kung fu right so the logical next step in the same process is to take the ultimate films in either genre so we're going to do enter the dragon and shaft ah classic examples of black exploitation and kung fu not in that order i suppose so what you're saying is you now trust the audience that we've lured them in and that they're willing to watch these older shows Mm -hmm. and the mutual agreement is that maybe we will have something to tell people about the two genres we haven't already that's right watch more fucking film god damn it